Welcome to ANN in depth. Today we'll be talking about the president of the General Conference of Seventh Day Adventists. If you're not familiar with what the General Conference means, that's the world headquarters of the Adventist Church. And whenever an Adventist is facing something that they don't like about their church or they disagree in some way, there is an instinct to write to the president of the world headquarters to say, fix this. Today we are here with the president of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church, Pastor Ted Wilson, to talk about what it means to have this ministry and what does the office of the president uh, do and what is their role in fulfilling the mission. Pastor Wilson, thank you for joining us again. Great to be with you, Pastor Sam. Some people have this idea that you wake up in the morning, have an idea, uh, tell the people to do it, and then the following week, the whole world is doing it. Uh, now, clearly, that is that doesn't happen. Never happened, never will happen. Tell us about this, the role of your office. What does it mean? How many vice presidents you have? And what what role your office plays in mission? Well, let me just first uh, bounce off of something you said in the introduction that, and a kind of a disclaimer, if people write to our office, and let me tell you, a lot of people do. They write emails, they write letters, they, you know, phone calls, whatever it is. And they do expect uh, the president to take action and solve all the problems. Well, I have to give a disclaimer that... You know, I can't solve all the problems, but <laughs> <What>? <laughs> uh, but we we are here to facilitate and to nurture people to f focus on the mission. That's really what it's all about. A lot of times you get mired down in problems and challenges and disagreements and people are upset, you know, about this or that. And really, we try as much as possible to help those things be solved at the lowest level possible where those situations occur. But it doesn't mean that we're totally deaf to try to help people at every level. Uh, we do have quite a structure in the General Conference that helps in the management of the overall aspects of our work. You mentioned vice presidents. We have seven vice presidents who take care of overseeing different departments of the church, act as advisors to those departments. They chair different boards of the general conference. They chair committees that are organized. They are an extension, if you will, of my office. Uh, when I say my office, I approach this in a very humble way because being the president of the general conference is an impossible job, uh, essentially, except that you lean on the Lord every day. You ask the Lord to give you wisdom every day. And then entrust the church into God's hands. Uh, we're not a hierarchical arrangement. I don't just proclaim something and it happens. You know, you you have to work with people. As we've referenced in, a, in, in another podcast, we are organized in a representative church governance arrangement. So you have to work with people. You have to work with committees. For instance, um, there is a president. In m most of our organizations, we have a president, a secretary, not to be confused with an office secretary, but a secretary of an organization. Uh, and not to say that office secretaries are not extremely important as well. They are, but this is a position. And then a treasurer or chief financial officer. Uh, these individuals work in tandem. They work together in church organization, uh, but they don't necessarily, the secretary and treasurer, report to me. They report, all of us, all three of us, report to the executive committee. That's another safeguard so that you don't have, you know, the president of an organization calling all the shots. That's not the way it works. You work in a collaborative way. I have to tell you, um, personally, we have a wonderful group right now that is working together in such a dynamic way. Uh, the, the, the secretary, Pastor Kohler, uh, the treasurer, 
uh, Pastor Douglas, and we work in a, in a very harmonious manner. We bounce ideas off of each other. We share things. We collectively try to come to a consensus on certain things as to how things ought to be directed, which committees they should go to, etc. So the administrative structure of the church is not just the president's office. It is secretariat and treasury. Then we have departments, which also feed into all of the things that we are attempting to do. And administration helps to facilitate the function of those departments. Today we call those who are heading up those departments directors. In the past, uh, there, was a, 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 there was nomenclature used that was probably more accurate, and it was called secretary the secretary of the communication department, the secretary of the Sabbath school department. Interesting. I did not know that. And it was that way for many years. Huh. And it's for a purpose. Who was the real leader of every one of those departments? The president. Hmm. He was to be involved. So when you, when you say director now, and you know the nomenclature we understand because we depend on people who are directors and all of that kind of thing, but it doesn't mean that administration then pulls away from the activities that are taking place. We're all in this together, part and parcel. The secretary, the treasurer, all together. Now, in terms of the president's office at the general conference, because it varies in di on different levels of organization, again, we have the General Conference, which is based on unions around the world, but then between the unions and the General Conference, we have divisions of the General Conference, and the official titles of those divisions should be, sometimes people don't quite get it right, uh, the such-and-such -such division of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, so that it's not a constituent level, the division, it is a division of the general commerce. We delegate to those areas, those regions of the world, we have 13 of them, uh, to carry out the functions of the general conference in those areas. And interestingly, Pastor Sam, every one of those presidents of divisions are also vice presidents of the general conference. So we have seven general vice presidents, we have 13 vice presidents who are presidents of divisions. So it's quite a group of people who get together then to help facilitate the ongoing activities. Uh, our office handles many, many different aspects of church life and activities. Uh, but let's just take, for instance, your idea. Okay, I wake up in the morning and I have an idea. Well, I, I do have ideas. <laughs> and uh, so do many other people. But then it's an opportunity to then start bouncing those ideas off of other people. And of course, you know the system. You know how to touch certain uh, buttons or certain bases in order to help nurture something. But uh, it's not that this is only my idea. And many times the ideas for church nurture, for church evangelistic outreach, for all kinds of things, come from many people or from an individual in a particular place. I'll give you an example. We have a, a new emphasis now called Back to the Altar, which is really a call for church members and families and young people to come back to the altar of God, to, to take time to study the Bible, to take time to pray, to really be recharged spiritually. Well, Family that, worship and... Family worship, exactly, and, and, all of that. And be careful with devices especially. It's like Exactly. Be careful with how much screen time <clears throat> you have and focus on the study of Scripture. And, Don't and, get derailed from your personal devotional time with the Lord by your devices, uh, your electronic devices, by whatever else, any number of distractions. Well, that idea came from uh, an individual who is part of our white estate, uh, Dwayne Esmond. 
And he came to my office. He says, I have this idea and I, I have a real burden for young people because they're just getting so siphoned off into electronic media and all that, which is a good thing in many ways if it's used correctly. So he brought that idea. We counseled with some other individuals uh, who, you know, working with family life and all of this. And then we talked, you know, we talked with other officers. We begin to develop. Then we figure out, okay, maybe uh, this can find a resting place in a particular area, uh, our Revival and Reformation Committee. And the process continues in a collaborative way. So when ideas come and, and certain objectives, it's not as though uh, we're doing this in a vacuum. It's not as though it's a, uh, you know, like I have all power and authority and I command and it happens next week. No, it takes time and you have to relate to people. When we are dealing with problems, uh, some real challenges, and let me tell you, we have some, some real problems. And I have to tell you, uh, a lot of it has to do, again, with self, with people's insistence that they, uh, they know what's best and nobody else does, or, or we're going to fight you on this or that, and rather than a loving, caring, collaborative approach, which is the way the church works. The, the, the church is really, it's, it's, not a, it's not a corporation or a company. Yes, we do have legal entities, but we really are a service uh, organization that runs on volunteers, uh, church members and everyone else, even though some are paid, of course, it's still a service organization. And you don't get the best out of a service organization when you command. Uh, you, you work in a collaborative way. But when we have problems and challenges, we have to consult. We have to talk. We have to listen. We have to work our way through. We have to discuss things. We have to pray. You know, much more can be done if we just spent more time asking the Lord, what do you want us to do? And have a prayerful attitude. So when we're dealing with challenges and problems, which we're doing right now, you know, all the time pretty much, uh, I consult and d deal with our division officers or with my local, my, I say local, our general conference immediate staff and, and all of those uh, my colleagues, I, I depend a lot on this beautiful relationship with our secretary and our treasurer. And we meet periodically to just go over many things. You've got to do this in order to accomplish things because the church is a beautiful mosaic of many people with a f wonderful focus, should be, on mission. So all that we do is really to facilitate the beautiful proclamation of Christ's salvation, his three angels' messages of Revelation 14 to prepare people for what is coming on this earth very shortly and what is happening, and ultimately Jesus' soon return. So I come back again to my office. My office helps to facilitate and coordinate essentially the onward progression of mission, and we deal with a lot of problems along the way in order to avoid an impedance to that mission. Got it. Two topics that I want to bring in and two threads that I want to pull. The first is the, uh, the, the idea of service times. You have, we are called for a specific set of time to serve. And then if the church sees if we want to continue or not, it makes decisions about that. And then I want to talk about what the struggles are to get any idea approved and the many ideas that are not approved. In fact, let's start with this one. For the last few years, we started to stream our meetings. Some of them are streamed. Our executive committee is streamed and there are other meetings that are streamed. And most of the items have support from the floor. The, the chair, usually a president or vice president, yourself or one of the vice president, brings up the item. Then there is a presentation on what that item is. And usually there are words of support and then we vote on it. That's the majority of uh, a, a global meeting. And some people get the picture that nobody has a disagreement. 
that everybody just supports. So, you know, whatever <laughs> they say just goes. Mm. And what people don't see is the months, perhaps years, where that idea has bounced around different people and... How correct you are. Tell us about the process <laughs> of only bringing an idea to the floor that has matured over this constant conversation with various parts of the world. Because, you know, people at home, they don't see that process. They don't see the struggles. And you mentioned the, the, uh, the collegial spirit and the collaborative spirit. That does not mean there aren't disagreements. And sometimes, and I've been in meetings with you, where there is there are disagreements and and people have different opinions and in a very respectful way you continue mentioning your point until but until there is some what of a consensus it's not wise to bring that to any any vote consensus is always better than majority uh, that seems to be the culture at the general conference that I've observed over the last 8 years tell us more about that <clears throat> maturing process of an idea before it goes to the agenda and you have observed well, Pastor Sam, <laughs> because there's no point in trying to bring something in where you're not going to get much support. What's the point in that? Uh, you, can, you can mandate it and try to force it, and uh, you won't get anywhere. I mean, you may get a vote for it, a majority vote, simply because people, well, okay, they want to vote this, I guess we'll vote. But you won't get any support afterwards. So what's the point with that? The, the whole process of how things happen is one which essentially is, as we have already mentioned, more of a collaborative arrangement, a collegial arrangement. In fact, the working policies of the church, and we have fairly thick book with working policies, governing this and you know all that kind of, all of that was done and is being done because it's always, it's, it's in, in, in flux all the time. There's always, there are always little changes and adjustments and what have you. It's all done with the understanding that what you come up with and what you actually vote will then be nicely abided by, if I can use that phrase, by individuals because we have this collegial agreement that we are in this Advent movement together because we love Jesus and we want to accomplish the mission. So it's this, it has to be this underlying collegial uh, relationship. That's why if you try to push something and force it uh, without adequate discussion, and you may have considerable disagreement, I'm not saying you wouldn't, but you eventually want to come to a point where people are in general agreement, you know, that's actually not a bad idea. I think that's something we ought to do. Uh, and that process takes sometimes years, as you say, because it has to go through certain levels of discussion. Uh, it starts out with, <clears throat> excuse me, some small committee that is looking at it, then makes a presentation back to the, the officers. The officers refine something. They then uh, send it on to a, a larger group. That group will look at it, add their, you know, emphasis and uh, refinement. And then finally, it will get to the floor of the executive committee, uh, generally of annual council or spring meeting of the executive committee. When that happens, uh, there are still individuals who are not even part of, quotes, the loop, because we have representatives from uh, pastoral level, from frontline worker level, from institutional level, and they may not have been in the loop, so to speak. But generally speaking, division officers and even union presidents uh, are ones who have heard about this. They understand it. They have been uh, they have been asked about it, or they have had part in the discussion. When you live with something for a while, when you adjust it, when you involve yourself, you then start to have some ownership in that project. So when it finally comes to the floor, a lot of people have had, as we would use in, in, in English language, buy-in to that particular idea. Doesn't mean that it wouldn't still have some stiff discussion, but uh, it generally will be more accepted because of the process. But you know, it really starts with the heart. And 
a connection. I get back to this, the personal connection. Uh, many of us within the system of the church are pastors. Uh, we are asked to be spiritual leaders. And one has to look at this not as a job, not as a political appointment, but as a sacred responsibility. And that's why every day, leaders within the church who are ordained ministers or people who are appointed to certain positions and our lay representatives uh, on the executive committees, all of them need to recognize their sacred spiritual responsibility. So the Holy Spirit has a huge part in helping a lot of these things happen during the process and then, as you've indicated, at the time that they're voted and and for many of these ideas, there's hardly any resistance because it's not only because we've had a process, but because the Holy Spirit has impressed people. You know, that's a great thing for the church. Let's do it. You know, I, I come to a beautiful verse in Jeremiah uh, chapter 3. And the Lord speaks to us in this because he says, I will give you pastors according to mine heart. I'm reading from King James here, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. So I think first and foremost, whether you are a pastor, whether you are an ordained minister, whether you are an appointed person within the structure, or a layperson who is involved with the executive committee and the progression of ideas, first and foremost, we need to be personally connected with the Lord so that the Holy Spirit is working in us to help us to feed people with knowledge and understanding. If we are only depending on our own expertise, our own educational training, our own natural skills, we are not going to be fulfilling what God has, has intended, which is that God will give leaders or pastors according to his heart. So all of us going into these structural procedures have to have the heart of Jesus. And, and that will bring an inevitable level of humility that is demanded by the job. I'll give you why that means, what that means for me. We, we have ideas, we have different things we, we believe to be <clears throat> necessary. And sometimes you're talking to, in my sphere, the communication leader in an event, let's say GAIN, our global event for technology and so on. Mm -hmm. I've had examples of lay people that heard what is said and then they come and they have insight that it's impossible for you not to see that it's better. The Holy Spirit chooses whoever he wants to choose that's to right. reveal what he wants. And let's be humble enough to say, you know, that's a better idea than I had. Yeah. <laughs> so th I've seen that happen many times. Now, I want to talk about the the different cultures and the level of respect that they demonstrate to, to leadership. Um, and there is a, a, a cultural measurement called the PDI, the Power Distance Index. And the higher the PDI, the more respect they show to leadership. The lower the PDI, uh, the less outward, it's not that they don't respect it, there's less outward demonstration of that uh, respect in, in action. There's a lot that can be said about it. But the world, working at the General Conference, you travel to different parts of the world and the treatment you get varies greatly. You know, I, I went to Peru and they had people singing in the airport and, and, you know, there's a whole demonstration because they were receiving a guest from the General Conference. And then you go to Scandinavia and, you know, you need to hire a car and go to the office meeting at the right time. No one's picking you up. So you have this difference of cultural presentation. I would like you to speak to the to the internal need for humility and understanding that that level of respect isn't for Ted Wilson. It's for the office of the president of the General Conference. It's for, it's for what you represent and not for you. And the dangers of believing that it is for you when you're no longer in that function. All of a sudden, it, you're, you know, it, people don't treat you the way they did. Uh, because it was never for you in the first place. It's for the office of what you represent. Your father was also a president of the General Conference. 
And I am sure, and in our conversations in the past, you mentioned many things that you learned just observing him that gave you a head start uh, in your ministry. So tell us about this, the function and the person and the need for humility and how you manage all of this. Well, it's a fascinating topic, actually. And one must always remember, you represent, first of all, the Lord in your actions, and you represent the world church. It's not about you. It's not about me as an individual. It's what I represent. And you're absolutely correct. Uh, <clears throat> when we travel around the world, because of the nature of being asked to represent the world, there is a certain amount of deference. There's a certain amount of um, respect. And as you said, it differs in different parts of the world depending on culture. But uh, all people, regardless of where we are, uh, need to have respect for those who represent God's church. When I say respect, I'm not saying bow down and say yes, yes, yes to everyone. No, not at all. You're respecting the office. You're respecting the representation that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is God's remnant church and the highest authority on earth is a general conference in session of which those of us who are representing the general conference tie into that to some extent. But you must never, ever imagine that this respect can be taken advantage of by you as an individual to achieve your own personal gain or some kind of, of power uh, leverage because immediately when you do that, you will lose connection with the real source of, of power, and that is heaven itself. You must always recognize that you're you've been asked to do something as a sacred responsibility and it is to be done in humility. Uh, you know, some people might say, well, of course, you're just talking the talk. You know, we, leaders need to be humble, but we know, you know, you're, you're really egotistical and self-centered and all. Well, if you're not careful, if I'm not careful, I will be that way. That's why every day we need to be submitting to the Lord through prayer. The first thing I do after waking up uh, and getting out of bed, I mean, I fall on my knees and I'm asking the Lord uh, to fill me with his spirit, to send the latter rain of the Holy Spirit into this earth. And the third thing, every day I'm asking for these three things. The third thing is wisdom, claiming essentially James chapter 1, verse 5. If you lack wisdom, ask for it. And the Lord has not, has, his, his arm is not shortened. He <laughs> gives wisdom. Let me tell you, you get into situations where you just, you scratch your head. What, what am I going to do? And the Lord gives you an idea. All of a sudden. He just, he just, <laughs> or he opens something up or someone says something. Or, I mean, it's amazing. You just, I mean, you know, it doesn't look like it at times because I'm not on my knees during a committee, but during times of intense discussion, you shoot a prayer to heaven. You, you, you're talking to the Lord, even as you're looking at people, whatever it is, and the Lord responds. It's just incredible. So Nancy and I, my dear wife, uh, she and I travel all over the world, visiting many places, some very small places, some very large engagements with many people. And we are given uh, certain gifts, you know, uh, cultural gifts, clothing, special outfits from that region or or a little pin or whatever it is, you know. I've seen some of those photos. Some of them are really funny. <laughs> well, I mean, and it's done out of a, a, a heart of love on sure. the part of our people. And uh, so... You could get a big head, and anyone working at the general conference or at the division or at the union level or a local conference or a pastor, don't ever get a big head thinking that it's all about you, that uh, somehow people are, 
Oh, pastor, you preach the greatest sermons. Oh, it's wonderful. You, know, you just, you know, when people compliment you, you thank them, but you say, praise be to God. You always give glory back to God because if you take it too seriously, you will be, you could become corrupt and you could become extremely self-centered and you could begin to think that everything really does revolve around you and it doesn't. No. It revolves around your relationship with the Lord. And the Lord is really the president of the general conference. He's the head of the church, so to speak. Well, he is the head of the church. He, so to speak, he's the president of the general conference and of every, every organization that we have. I can't emphasize enough, Pastor Sam, the need for personal humility and connection with the Lord every day. Because the devil is, he is so insistent on trying to bring self up in you, in me, that if we're not careful, we will start to believe a lie which says, wow, this organization can't get along without me. I'm really important. And once you get to that point, you're finished because it's this constant, constant dependence on the Lord. I mean, I'm drawn to, um, you know, Jeremiah 32. I, you know, referenced Jeremiah before. It's a big book. It has good information for us. Um, you know, the challenges we face and the, the difficulties we face could be overwhelming and if you think you have all the answers, then you're really in trouble. So at my level in the general conference, where everything, you know, finally ends up on my desk, so to speak, and then I try to, you know, uh, delegate things to be taken care of or whatever. Uh, many people, of course, take care of things before they get to my desk, then don't get me wrong. But if I thought that I had all wisdom to accomplish things and that, you know, when I wake up in the morning and I make this proclamation, it's all going to be solved, you're greatly misled. And, and in Scripture, it says in verse 27 of, of Jeremiah 32, and the Lord is speaking, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? And that's the reference that every president, every secretary, every treasurer, every pastor, every department director, everybody involved in teaching, in health ministry, in publishing, doesn't matter what it is, all of us need to refer back to the Lord's ability to accomplish and facilitate through us in a humble, simple way the mission of the church. So the Lord's saying, is there anything too hard for me? Well, no. There isn't. I mean, that's the obvious answer. But you go to the next chapter, chapter 33, and verse 3, and God is again speaking, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not, which you don't know. I'm the source of the real power. I'm the source of the accomplishment for the church. And Pastor Sam, I, I have to remember to lean on the Lord myself all the time. Otherwise, if I took it seriously, personally, when I travel in all of these lovely demonstrations of respect and of asking for advice and of showing deference and all of that, if I wasn't careful, I could just start to think, well, you know, they chose the right person. I'm, I'm really it. I'm pretty good. Yeah, I'm pretty good. <laughs> and that would be absolutely detrimental to any effectiveness that I would have because everything comes back to leaning on the Lord every day and recognizing nothing is too hard for the Lord if you lean on him. If you call on him, he'll show you great and mighty things. He'll open the way. And that's the way the work is going to be finished as well. Our complete dependence, whether you're the president of an organization, whether you are uh, someone who is working within the structure and think you're insignificant, we're all important in this process because we're all part of God's final proclamation his three angels' messages, preparing people 
for his soon coming, turning people back to the true worship of God, helping people to understand the Word of God. Getting back to understanding the Word is probably one of the most important responsibilities I have. So, Pastor Sam, it's just exciting to be part of this work, but to recognize this is God's work. We are very allergic to campaigning. Adventists are very allergic to campaigning. Whenever somebody starts campaigning, you know, there's a session coming in a couple of years and next year. And I remember learning this lesson at a local conference executive committee where there was a particular name that was uh, one of the names mentioned for president. And it, it, it gathered support within the nominating committee. And it would have likely been the name that was voted. And one of the sisters, one of the lay sisters that was there, mentioned just before the vote um, of this nominating committee, only in, the, in that room. She said, yes, he will be a wonderful president. I know that he's wanted this for many years. And he's always thought that he would be great at this. And I, I believe she was speaking in support of him. As soon as she mentioned that he wanted this for many years, the name just collapsed <laughs> and it was gone because we are allergic to politicizing of, of this desire for no matter how good the intentions are, even if you could see yourself doing that ministry well, campaigning for it is the end of that process because we're very sensitive to people that want uh, positions of more influence and at the same time, you need to prepare yourself in case God calls you for that as much as possible. What were the lessons in, in this whole, because you've worked for the church for many years, you grew up, your, your dad was a pastor too. What were the lessons you learned from him about this whole tension between everything is, is the Lord's, um, but I do have a responsibility for the church? How? Tell me more about that. Well, first of all, <clears throat> I learned many, many things from my dad and uh, watched him uh, over many years and uh, would call him and ask for advice, uh, you know, well into his retirement years. And it was, a, it, it was a beautiful way of connecting with someone who had enormous experience. And uh, one of these days I'll see him again when the Lord returns because he's now resting in the grave. But I learned a lot from him. And a number of things that I learned especially uh, were to, to listen a lot, uh, to watch what's happening, to take a particular interest in what people are saying or who they are, uh, ask about their families, uh, ask about, you know, their background, find out how they fit into the whole mission picture. Um, so you need to be observant, uh, not only of church members and all that, but public settings, wherever you're you're involved in public activities, be observant as to what's going on. Uh, and that requires listening a lot more than talking. Uh, certainly, there's a place for talking, and that's part of leadership. But it comes from the opportunity of assessing things, uh, of realizing that um, there is value in what people are sharing, and you need to give them credit for that. Um, I also learned from my father that you need to do the best job wherever you're placed. Just dig in and do your work. And also to uh, not worry too much about what people say if you are following what you know to be according to the Bible and scriptural instruction, as well as spirit of prophecy instruction. I, I learned great, great appreciation for the Bible and for the spirit of prophecy from both of my parents. My, my mother was a, a wonderful person and believed in God's church and in, 
in the word of God and the spirit of prophecy, and the same from my father. I never heard once growing up and into my uh, adult years, never once from either one of those parents, my parents, any detrimental thing about the word of God or the spirit of prophecy, only encouragement and focus and, and respect for God's instructions. And that's probably a huge thing that I learned from my dad as well, to, to respect what is the spiritual instruction from heaven itself and not to contest it, not to fight against it. I also was blessed with an, an affirming um, home. My parents would tell me, and my dad especially, but my mother also, uh, you know, w within the context, my dad would say, we believe in you. When you hear that, you know, that spurs you on to doing your best. And you don't want to disappoint them. You, you recognize that you're part of this, this family. You're part of the world family. You're part of the church family that's looking forward to Jesus soon coming. And for me, the greatest climax in Earth's history uh, of course, built upon the, upon the sacrifice Jesus made at Calvary and the crucifixion, his ministry as our high priest. But the highlight is the second coming of Jesus when all of this will become uh, a, a, a beautiful climax of what everything uh, has taken place and what, what is being what we're doing as as a as a church family. So I've learned a lot of things from my dad, especially also in dealing with dignitaries and people of other faiths. Uh, when you meet someone of of high rank in a government, uh, you need to show that respect and that deference, but also realize that they are people. They need spiritual instruction and encouragement. So when I meet the president or a prime minister or you know some ministerial uh, uh, secretary of a, of, a, of a government or whatever it is, you know, you, you share with them something from the Word of God. You ask first, if they would permit, and then you, you ask if you can pray for them and for the nation and for the work. Almost invariably, they will say yes. Uh, maybe some out of, you know, diplomatic politeness, but many are personally very moved after you pray and that you pray for their families you pray for their their own work and their activities and for the nation when you when you learn to do that and take an interest uh, in the personal lives of those who are leading organizations or governments or whatever you realize that truly you can act in a really a pastoral fashion so these kinds of things I have learned from my father. I've also learned, you know, and he was much better at it than I, than I am. Uh, he was very analytical. He would take a problem. He would work at it from every different angle, and he would write many notes. And, of course, I write many notes too. But <laughs> uh, you, you, you learn things to help you to work in your experience. But you got back, you, you, let's get back to this political aspect. I don't care what level you are working at, where you are. The Bible tells us to, uh, to, to do the best we can where we are. And then you allow other people to assess that. You don't go around and try to elicit um, political support and all that kind of thing. You, you leave that with the Holy Spirit and with others who may notice what you're doing, but you, you don't personally involve yourself in that. Once you do that, you are drawing attention to yourself as opposed to drawing attention to the Lord and the real purpose of your work. So I don't want to say that politics don't take place in the church because we know they do, unfortunately. You want to minimize that. You want to, you want to downplay that. You want the Holy Spirit 
to guide and to lead. Uh, you want the Holy Spirit to influence people in nominating committees when they are looking at names for particular offices. You don't want just a political solution. You want heaven's solution because heaven can work through humble, caring people who have a heart after the Lord's heart. And I suppose that really is the basis for true effectiveness when you can humble yourself before the Lord and say, Lord, use me in any way that you wish, at any level, in any place. I am yours to be used by you to advance your mission. And then, just like, you know, Isaiah, um, he says, here am I. I'm here. Send me. Go. I'll go. I'll go anywhere <laughs> because I love you so much, Lord. So, well, we've wandered a long ways from your first question, but I think really a sense of your place in the entire scheme of things is important, and that place is as a humble servant at the foot of the cross. And when you have that mindset and you're in direct connection with the Lord, because he's the only one that can bring that humility into your life. Normally, we are very proud and self-seeking, and uh, we need to be brought into a humble relationship with the Lord. And when you, when you do that, you can be the most effective leader possible because you're in connection with the one who gives you the power and it doesn't come from you. Praise the Lord. Pastor Ted Wilson, thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for listening to ANN In-Depth. I hope this was a blessing to you. Share it with others and subscribe so you get all of the podcasts in the future. If you have something, a comment or a thought, don't forget to go to our YouTube. Find this video on YouTube and add your comments there. We read all of them. Once again, thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next week.